Good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren. Um, All right. Good morning, everyone. I am Lauren. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to Father Brian Hare. Father Hare is currently the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of the Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he is also the Secretary for Healthcare and Social Services in the Archdiocese of Boston. Prior to serving in his current positions, he was a faculty member at Georgetown University and a faculty member and dean at the Harvard Divinity School. He also served as the president and CEO of Catholic Charities USA. His research and writing focus on ethics and foreign policy and the role of religion in world politics and in American society. His courses, his courses at the Kennedy School include The Politics and Ethics of Statecraft, Religion and Politics, Defining the Actors and Debating the Issues, and The Politics and Ethics of the Use of Force. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Brian here. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. I was here, I think it was two years ago. Yes. That was the last time I came, so I'm delighted to be here. And while that's a long title, The Use of Force and Moral Obligations, what we're going to talk about is ethics and war. Ethics and war. Morality and war. How you think about it. Because, oh, wait a minute. I Sorry. knew I wouldn't press the right button. <laughs> All right, so did you miss any of that? No, <laughs> okay, all right. So we're gonna talk about morality and war. So is that hard to talk about or easy to talk about? That's the way to begin. And before I think out loud about that, I'd like to have you think out loud about it. So some people say war is the hardest moral case. If you can think clearly about war, you probably can think clearly about many other problems in life. So let's try and think about morality and war. What makes war a hard moral problem? Uh, people Jasmine? Die. Yeah. Yep. People die. <laughs> people and are killed. Die. Yeah. People die. Well, people die from a lot of reasons. I bet Catherine talked about people dying from disease, mm -hmm. hunger. Is well, people are different than that. It's it's your people are killed uh, in the name of something. Um, uh -huh. So it's not necessarily from natural causes or um, any anything else besides you know. All right. Uh, so it isn't just that people die. Yeah. It's that some people kill other people. Yeah. So is the moral problem that they die, or the moral problem that someone kills someone else? Yes. What justifies... These name tags very uh, well. I'm Allison. Allison. Uh, what justifies an attack, or what justifies the beginning what of a war? Justify. So that sounds What's to me like moral? you think some killing might be moral. I, I think it's case by case. Case by case. But you wouldn't be prepared to say all killing is morally wrong. Or would you? I'm not sure. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Twice a year, Harvard brings in people from all over the world, government, military people. I ask them the same question. They tell me I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. All right? Okay, so you should feel at home. All right? All right? Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a moral obligation not to kill people. We don't walk around and shoot people in the street. Mm -hmm. That seems like the right mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, there are moments where suddenly it seems like that moral obligation is removed. When changes, it, maybe. Changes, exactly. uh -huh. uh -huh. And so it's this weird, and it seems like not killing people is one of the most fundamental moral principles, um, but it's the one where, it's the one that, changes most radically. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So to go back to Allison's question, she said maybe some could be justified. Maybe. And you're saying that's where the change would happen. You'd go from you'd go from the sense that we don't go around killing people 
to maybe this is a case where we should or we have to? What makes more what makes war hard? Yes. Um, I think when we oh sorry, I'm here. Right? Yeah, hero. Um when we address Oh, that's on. Um, when we think about a lot of moral and ethical questions, we think about them in terms of the relationships we have with people, uh -huh. um, and we think of, we consider people as people and those people that we interact with and, like I said, have relationships with. But I think when we start questioning war, that kind of goes out the window um, because we don't necessarily. We don't think about our relationships with the other people? Not on a person-to-person -person level. We don't really, we tend not to see individual people. So the other people become the enemy. Yeah. Right. Um, or just a, a country or an ideology we're against. Um, so I think that changes a bit. But would you want to say that all enemies are eligible to be killed? No, not at all. No, no. So <laughs> even with enemies, you have to start to sort them out. Uh -huh. All right. Yes, Emma. Um, sort of related to what Hero was saying, when, like, we have a sense that killing people is wrong, except That's we have we have that sense, but we also make exceptions in cases of self-defense. So, mm -hmm. um, and we have, I guess, a sense of war and and conflict using armies as based out of self-defense, you know, a country needs to send their army to protect mm -hmm. that country. Mm -hmm. But when the, with the individual people involved, like if you're a soldier in an army, the soldiers in the other army don't necessarily want to kill you or are going to hurt you if you don't fight. Mm -hmm. but, but yet if you don't, as a country, don't do anything, then that country could hurt you. But the individuals mm -hmm. don't have any conflict like that. All right. Now, so you started by raising self-defense. So, if some killing could be justified, if, so we're with Allison, not sure, if, okay, do you think it would be a simpler case to defend, to defend the proposition that self-defense is morally justifiable, or is it easier to defend the proposition that defense of your state against another state is justifiable? Is self-defense easier or harder to make the case for? Catherine. Um, so I think that self-defense, like I think one of the most compelling reasons for war, if there is one, is that like by killing some people, you could prevent the deaths mm -hmm. of more people. But that's when you're talking about the state to state, aren't you? Well, you're, you're protecting Massachusetts and Omaha and Seattle against somebody else. Yeah. But in like that, those people are threatening. So by ki like by killing people who theoretically threaten the lives of other people, you're like mm -hmm. saving more lives. Okay. So I think yeah, but that's like really hard in practice to actually tell if that will happen or. All right. So you're not sure. War is unpredictable. Charlotte, and then Zoe. Hi, I was thinking also about the impact of civilians and communities of where the wars are being uh -huh. fought. And we think about, we're talking a lot about the value of human life and whether that differs for our soldiers. All wars are going to affect civilians in the communities and the style where it's being fought. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to think about the impact of what, it, how, what is the difference between the value of a life that's killed of a civilian and the life that's killed of a soldier. They're both people, but they're both playing very different roles in the war. So you raise civilians. So let's take World War II. Mm -hmm. Hitler was hard to like, huh? Okay, all right, uh, we start that. Okay, Hitler's hard to like, okay, all right. So, and particularly given what he was doing to other people, Hero's point, relation, whole categories of people were being killed. Yeah. All right. So, many people said it's justifiable to go to war against Hitler. Yeah. Then people said it's justifiable to go to war against Hitler's army military. Right. Then somebody said, it's justifiable to go to war against the German people. Right. All three of those right, some of them right, some of them wrong. What do you think? 
I think it's challenging because when you think about the Holocaust and it gets into a human rights violation, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. as a Jewish person, that's Hit kind of the, the yeah, yeah, that's kind right. of my, my right. perspective. All right. All right. Um, All right. So I think I think that you wouldn't that have piece. any trouble. You wouldn't have any trouble participating in an assassination of Hitler. I I wouldn't. I would have trouble in participating in a punishment of Hitler in a, in a, of, okay. as a human rights violation. you slipped by me on that one. Yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it wasn't exactly clear cut. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're slipping by me on Hitler, you must have an even harder time of both taking on Hitler's military, yeah. all those 19-year-old German kids. I do. How about, how about the people living in the middle of Dresden? Mm-hmm. when we bombed Dresden? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Zoe. Where do you want to go with this, Zoe? I think I just became a pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> right this minute. Right, <laughs> right this minute. Um, for me, the relationship between self-defense and war was a really key relationship because mm. I've studied self-defense, and in self-defense, the goal is not to kill the attacker. Mm-hmm. The goal is to knock the attacker out mm-hmm. so that they can stop hurting you. Mm-hmm. And then the next goal, after you've checked that the attacker is knocked out and can no longer attack mm-hmm. you, you run away. Mm-hmm. And I think that in war, uh, it, it might actually be really important that what you do is not kill all the people, but you knock them out. Um, and, and this might be something different, and there are techniques in self-defense that you learn so mm-hmm. that you don't have to hurt the person other than to knock them out and to protect yourself. And so in war, there are techniques, and maybe as countries, as nations, as a world, we don't know these techniques yet. Okay, um, but you think you may have just had a conversion yes, moment in this I, class. <laughs> 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 all right, okay, all right. I have two hands up, and I can't read out either sign. Okay. Um, I would say that in terms of war, I don't, first of all, I don't know how you would knock an army out mm. without Okay. Well, you and Zoe debilit- can have a conversation <laughs> over lunch about that. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> but in terms of Dresden, as far as I understand it, and I'm not a historical expert at all, but it wasn't a strategic military strike. That was mm-hmm. just a strike against mm-hmm. part of Germany to make a statement. Mm-hmm. As far as I know, there wasn't. Mm-hmm. a strong military hold of German soldiers there. It was towards the end of the war. That was clearly just striking for striking's sake. So I think in war there are actions that are just and unjust, but I do not disagree with the idea that there are cases where it is morally right to go to war for a principal or... Let me capture what you just said. Okay. So I thought you said there are, it's possible to distinguish wars as just and unjust. Yes. Okay. But within war... But within war, there are just actions and unjust actions. Okay. All right. Talon. Uh, Talene, yes. Uh, I was also thinking about the whole self-defense, if you want to knock somebody out but not necessarily wipe out a whole entire community. Mm -hmm. Um, As war becomes you know, a victim of technology as well and technological advancements, we now have drone warfare uh, coming up and... So then I guess some governments believe that you can just have one precision strike that knocks out that one person who's the threat. But how is we that? We may have effective? cyber war. You just have <laughs> one strike and then there's no more the electricity. Economy is out as Sony well. <laughs> found out, okay? But, <laughs> but that may just be the beginning, okay? <laughs> but then there's the whole ethics surrounding that one precision strike as well. Is it okay to blur the lines between country sovereignty and send your technology in to mm. kill a man, even if you perceive him as a threat. So now we got sovereignty in this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sovereignty. Okay. Mel- Melanie. Yeah. Melanie? Yeah. Where is the microphone? There we are. Um, on another point, I just wanted to say, like, war is expensive and resource draining. So, um, mm-hmm. I mean, there needs to be a balance between like what those expenses and mm-hmm. resources can be used for cost you, benefit you know, judgment in other more. in other mm-hmm. cases too. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Lydia, Sarah, Jasmine, and then I'll have to go to work and earn my salary. <laughs> okay? All right. Um, yes, yeah, so at the end of Talene's comment, 
actually said something that really highlights um, one of the problems I have with the self-defense narrative, which is you have to perceive something as a threat. Um, and I think those perceptions can be problematic in themselves. And the moral obligation to go to war based on self-defense really depends on your understanding of your own uh, self being threatened. Um, and I, what about if you were asked to go to war and it really didn't bear on your self-defense? What if somebody said, um, it's time to stop ISIS? ISIS is not an immediate threat to the United States, but it's time to stop ISIS. Does that sound right, wrong? I mean, I think it's right to some, but it's wrong to others. <laughs> it's, it's right for someone to stop ISIS, but it's not That's right like for Allison. everyone to Allison, stop ISIS. Not sure about that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, where else did I have Sarah? Um, so, building off Jane's comment a little bit, um, the, I have kind of a problem talking about war as if it's all the same thing. I mean, you have sort of a changing definition of war, I feel like, you know, way back, sort of pre-industrial revolution, you had certain classes that would stand in and like go to war and sort of symbolically fight out these things. And mm -hmm. then that would be sort of like concentrated there. And, you know, it didn't affect huge populations the way the wars of last century did. Mm -hmm. And then last century you had um, some things that were just done purely in the name of nationalism, with like, which I definitely do not agree with. Um, and then you had other instances where there was like a very cal careful calculation of like, you know, which would sort of yield the, like what decisions would yield the greatest net protection of life in general. Like, you know, how many human mm -hmm. lives are mm -hmm. going to occur if you go down this mm -hmm. different angle of the decision tree. Um, and then now you have a definition of war, like you said, that's sort of on the, on the event horizon that we're seeing where you can disable communication systems, completely take out the power of a government and maybe the one or two key players where you have, mm -hmm. you know, a really, mm -hmm. these, these points mm -hmm. that really enable in the, the type of threat that you're seeking okay. to prevent. Right. Um, and I feel like they are, those, all those definitions are very different so things. war might be justified, but you've got to determine what kind of war you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. very based on capabilities. Right. Now, Jasmine, I started with you, and I haven't asked Charlotte. Yes, I have. So you, I'll talk to Jasmine and Charlotte. Well, you all look alike. <laughs> all right, Jasmine, go ahead. <laughs> from war like what is what is what is the positive thing that we get out of it like I think that there should be we should be more inventive and more imaginative in ways that we resolve conflicts like people do bad things like for sure that's something that's unavoidable but <laughs> killing and bombing and raping mm -hmm. and all this the mm -hmm. stuff that comes along with war I've I oh. just would imagine, like, what would a future look like without that kind of, right. of conflict well, resolution? Well, Churchill, Churchill brought the English people to live through the German bombing, to come back and to fight a war that included 50 million dead. But Churchill later in life said it's better to jaw jaw than war war. But that didn't stop him from rising up. All right, now who have I said I would take? Oh, Charlotte. Yeah. People, um, a, couple, a couple of people have implied um, that with technology we can increase the precision of the violence and say only take out the Hitler and not take on his army. Mm. But I think there will inevitably be civilian casualties in that, even at a very small amount. But the more important point is that you're still creating a sense of terror within that country or within that nation and sort of the invisible effect on the people. That might have been the reason for Dresden. Yeah, and sort of a... Create a sense of terror and to break the will of the population. Not the army, not Hitler, the population. But that was the purpose of Hitler's bombing of London, too. They did that very deliberately. And I think with, with these sort of drone strikes, it's, it's a, a consequence that might not be intentional, but it's also sort of convenient. Okay. All right. Good. Well, that was good. Is war a hard problem? Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll agree on that anyway. So how do you think in straight lines about a hard problem? Or maybe it's not a good idea to think in straight lines about a hard problem. So let's figure out. 
So what do I want to do? I want to do three things. I want to start by looking quickly at how people have thought about morality and war over a very long period of time. Secondly, I want to take one way of thinking about morality and war. It's called the just war theory and talk about that. And thirdly, I want to take three political strategic problems of the day, namely nuclear weapons, humanitarian intervention, and terrorism, and think about how the just war ethic might apply to all three of them. So that's what I want to do, okay? So let's begin. How, do, how have people thought about the morality of war? Well, I think if you go back 2,500 years, okay, uh, this is the kind of thing drives historians crazy when ethicists say, well, I'm going to talk about 2,500 years in 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> so, but I mean, that's what, if you go back 2,500 years, there are three broad traditions, I think, about thinking about war morally. Now, I describe a tradition as a coherent body of intellectual data within which you can have a pluralism of positions, but the tradition is identifiable, okay? So I would say there are three broad traditions. The first tradition, I think, is the one that when you ask people to think about morality and war for the first time, people reach for it. And that tradition says, that the moral problem of war, which is this, the moral problem of war is this. Is it ever morally acceptable to carry out systematic, organized, large-scale killing of human beings? Because while there are different kinds of war, there's no way that war, as we have known it, gets away from the conscious, purposeful, large-scale killing of human beings. Is that ever morally, accept ever morally acceptable? The first position says it isn't. The first position says that the large-scale, conscious, purposeful killing of human beings is always morally wrong. Now, if you develop that position coherently, intellectually, you will get a version of the moral theory of pacifism. Sometimes it's religiously grounded. Sometimes it's philosophically grounded. Sometimes it's both. But essentially what pacifism does is to place war outside the moral universe. It doesn't belong in the moral universe. War and morality are contradictory terms. Now, there's a footnote to this story, and the footnote is nonviolence. Sometimes people collapse pacifism and nonviolence, but I think that's a mistake. Nonviolence is a tactic. It is a philosophy, but it's also a tactic. So you can find people who use nonviolence, but are not necessarily, in principle, committed pacifists. There were people in South Africa as the black population fought against the minority regime who used nonviolence but were not committed pacifists. There were people in Eastern and Central Europe who fought against communism, used the tactic of nonviolence, but if you ask them, are you an in principled pacifist, they would say no. So that's the first tradition. It puts war outside the moral universe. Second position uh, is the counterpoint to pacifism. It is what I'll call classical realism. Now, realism, as you know, is a whole philosophy of international relations and foreign policy. It is a very, it is a very uh, a sort of commonly understood position of international relations and foreign policy. Some would argue it's the dominant theory in international relations. So there are different kinds of realists. That's what I mean by there's a tradition with a pluralism of, so not every realist is going to agree with what I'm going to say now. 
but to frame the debate on morality and war, I want to talk about the classical realists. And the best example of a classical realist you find in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian Wars. So there is the Malayan dialogue in the history of the Peloponnesian Wars where uh, Athens is one of the great powers of the day, and they are challenged by Melos. Tiny little place, but an uppity place, an uppity place. They are not simply going to be ordered around by the Athenians. And the Athenians have a famous debate about what do we do about the Malayans. And the Athenians say, not only can't we afford to have an uppity colony, give us a hard time. But if the rest of the world thinks they can stand up to us, we're going to be, our, our reputation's going to decline as a great power. So you've got to take care of the Malayans. But the Athenians have that kind of hesitation that Priyanka talked about. So the Athenians, the Athenian generals go to the Malayans to have a conversation before they go to war. And they say to the Malayans, come now. Let us have no talk about justice. Let us have no talk about morality. Let us talk about the world as it is, realism. And in the world as it is, the strong do what they will, and the weak do what they must. Now, you don't have to conclude from that that the Athenians had no morality. <laughs> the Athenian generals might have been great spouses, great parents, good citizens in Athens. But what they were saying is, war is a distinct form of human activity, different from everything else. And so when it's time to go to war, there's no room for restraint, no room for moral distinctions. The only moral objective in war is to win it then you go back to normalcy, and that's where morality can function. So the classical realists place war outside the moral universe, too, for very different reasons than the pacifists. One of the best books on this topic is a book by a philosopher named Michael Walzer. It's called Just and Unjust Wars. And the opening chapter of that book is entitled Against Realism. And what Walter is saying is, unless I can defeat the realist answer, there's no room for the rest of my book. <laughs> because the realist answer says, war, the nature of war, the dynamics of war, the methods of war, and the stakes of war are such that there's no room for morality. So you get two positions that place war outside the moral universe that have been long-term positions. The third position is the one I'm going to talk more about, and it is what's called the just war argument. Over against the first two positions, the just war argument says, over against pacifism, there are some situations where the nature of the situation is such that however tragically it is the case, war is justifiable. So some uses of force are morally acceptable, the just war position says, over against the pacifist. Over against the classical realist, the just war argument says, not all uses of force are morally acceptable. So it positions itself over against the two other positions that place war outside the moral universe. So now, what's the nature of this position, this third position? Well, the first thing to notice is that the pacifist and the classical realist have solved the problem forever. <laughs> See, if Zoe's had a real conversion, she doesn't have to have struggle anymore. She's got a position. She's got a position. The pacifist says, I can't conceive of a situation where I would use, where I would in, be involved in the large-scale systematic taking of human life. 
Now the pacifist does not say that I won't resist evil. It says I will resist evil up to the point that I have to kill somebody. The classical realist solves the problem by saying don't even bother talking about morality. It's out of place when the issue is war. Now, do not think of these positions as ancient and gone by. Every time there's a major national security crisis, read the letters to the editor in the paper, and you will find both of these positions articulated. And then you will find some who try to defend the third position. But notice the third position, every time you go to force, you go to use force, you've got to justify the case every single time. Because some uses of force are justifiable, but not all uses of force are justifiable. So is this use of force justifiable in this case? So the just war tradition gets involved in what moral philosophers call casuistry. Case analysis, case analysis in light of a body of principles that you apply to cases, like lawyers do. Okay, so what is the just war ethic? How do you build a framework where you can make judgments about which uses of force are morally acceptable and which uses of force are not morally acceptable? Well, the argument has three steps. It starts with what I will call the distinction between a presumption and an absolute moral rule. An absolute moral rule does not admit of any exceptions. Now there is one absolute moral rule in the just war ethic, but the just war ethic begins with a presumption it's not unlike Prinicus argument. That is to say, the presumption is that you don't go around killing people to resolve problems, individual problems or political problems. So there's a strong presumption that the taking of human life is not permissible. The question is, is that presumption an absolute moral rule? that doesn't ever admit of exceptions. Well, for the pacifist, it is an absolute moral rule. But a presumption is a moral principle that guides your behavior most of the time. But a presumption admits of the possibility that there are exceptions to the presumption, exceptions which override the presumption. That makes sense? Okay, all right. So then, if there is the possibility of exceptions, then the question becomes, how do you determine a justifiable exception? So that's the next step in the ethic. You start with a presumption that admits of exceptions. <coughs> the second step is to ask three questions. And those three questions help you to determine what's a justifiable exception. So the three questions are why, when, and how. Why, for what reason, could the large-scale, systematic, planned taking of human life be morally acceptable? What kind of reason would justify that? The when question is, if you think you have a justifiable cause under why, you still have some other things to satisfy. And the how question is how you fight a war that you have determined is just. Okay? So why? Well, let me detour here for a minute because you all got involved in self-defense and national security. So the beginning of this tradition it traces back as far as Cicero. You can find Cicero talking about this. 
But the person who's usually identified as the source of this moral tradition uh, is a man named Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo was a bishop in northern Africa in the fifth century. Now, Augustine was a Catholic bishop, and he lived at a time when the Roman Empire was collapsing around him, and he was a Roman in that sense. And Augustine basically uh, was disturbed because as the Roman Empire was collapsing, people were saying, the reason we're not what we used to be, an empire that could defend itself, the reason we're not what we used to be in the good old days is we have too many Christians around. So they read a book that says, uh, when they ask for your coat, give them your cloak, turn the other cheek, do no harm to evildoers. And so they say, well, we just can't have an ethic like that. So Augustine felt that the Christians were being blamed for the fall of the empire. So Augustine decided he'd write a defense of the Christians. So he wrote 500 pages. It took him 10 years. And the book is called The City of God. It's not reading for the beach. It's, 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 it's not. So Augustine wrote, but in the midst of that book, Augustine had to defend the question, will Christians kill for the state? Will Christians kill for the state? So this is the way Augustine solved it. He started with self-defense. And he said, if someone wants to take my life and I have to kill them to defend my life, I will offer no resistance. My life is not important enough to kill somebody else for it. But, Augustine said, the problem changes when there's a third party involved. So if a third party is being about to be killed and has given no reason to have that done to them, and I can protect the third party, I now have to go to the defense of the third party and use the means necessary to protect them. Now, I'm talking about that as if we're all individual ethics. Augustine is talking about how people who have responsibility for the political community, governors, presidents, emperors, what their responsibility is. So Augustine basically said, but Augustine had no doctrine of self-defense but he did have a doctrine of just war. That those responsible for the political community had a broader range of responsibilities than the individual citizen, and therefore a broader range of rights that could be exercised, including the taking of life of those aggressing against the political community. And, he said, those responsible for the political community could then deputize citizens. So they had the right to kill for the state. So the why question begins with Augustine. What constitutes a just cause? What kind of issue justifies the use of force? And Augustine, and not just Augustine, this tradition has really sort of worked its way through to three broad reasons that can justify the use of force. First, you can take life to protect life, Augustine's point. You can take life to protect life. So there, you value all human life. All human life is valuable. But it's possible that people, by their actions, can be distinguished between aggressors and victims. So the first just cause traditionally has been what in political terms we call aggression. Secondly, you can take life to prevent the large-scale systematic violation of human rights, but all the adjectives are important. Large-scale systematic violation of human rights. 
Now, if the first cause is you can go to war to prevent aggression, the second cause would be represented by you can go to a war to, present, to prevent genocide, large-scale, systematic. So I'm not saying that every human rights violation in the world justifies war. If that were the case, we'd be at war every day. So you can go to war to prevent aggression. You can go to war to prevent genocide. The third position says you can take up arms if you're in a society where the political authority has made human life, human dignity, and the protection of human rights basically impossible. So one of Augustine's successors, Thomas Aquinas, said, when the government becomes the enemy of everyone, then, people, then the government has lost the right to rule. Now, it's hard to determine who gets the right to rule. If you think of revolutionary situations, it's one thing to say Mr. Assad has lost the right to rule. It's hard to figure out who's gained the right to rule among the various groups. Now, those three broad reasons give you an idea of what constitutes just cause. Aggression, genocide, and what's called domestically the right to revolution. Notice that no one is saying that what justifies war is to prove you're number one. What justifies war is to whip the allies in line. Or maybe to keep the straits open so the oil flows well. Not every reason that states go to war for are justifiable. So let's presume it's possible to think of an exception that fits that. You then have to go on and ask other questions. So someone says, well, if I've got a just cause, why do I have to ask other questions? And the reason for that is because war is hard. War is a blunt instrument of justice. I teach a lot of the military, both at Harvard and at the National War College. And the people who have been to war are the people who know the truth of that statement. War is unpredictable, a blunt instrument. It never works out the way you think it's going to work out, even when you've planned well. So if you're going to go to war, you have to have a just cause and some other reason. So the when questions presume you've got a just cause. Then you ask other questions. What do you ask? Well, first, proper authority. Now, this is Augustine's question. Augustine thought that ordinary citizens didn't have the right to go around killing people. But rulers of political communities had responsibilities that might necessitate the use of force. So today, who constitutes a proper authority? Well, since the 17th century, we've said sovereign states. The leaders of sovereign states constitute proper authority. But since 1945, we've supplemented that political judgment with a legal judgment of the UN Charter. And the UN Charter says, basically, states should not settle their differences by force. That's Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. But the UN Charter also says, in Article 51, if states are attacked, they have the right to use force. Aggression is wrong. So the Charter says states do have the right but the way they go to war should correspond to the UN Charter, which is not a moral document, it's a legal document. So you now have political legal arguments about who constitutes proper authority. But when we get to intervention, there are big debates about intervention. If it's not aggression against you, do you have the right to intervene in Kosovo, in Somalia? in Sierra Leone. Who has the right to intervene? Who has the right to intervene in Syria? 
Anybody? Everybody? Nobody? So proper authority. Secondly, right intention. Augustine said that the worst thing that happens in war is not that people get killed. He said from a moral point of view, the worst thing that happens in war is that it sets loose the passions that overcome human nature. He said that's what happens in war. So what is the intention? What is the driving force that's moving people to war? Is it aggression, genocide, or have they got another reason entirely? So you have to, when the Minister of Defense says we're going to war because of X, you have to check that out and ask what's really driving things. Some ancient grudge? I'd like a piece of their land. I'd like their oil wells. What's the right intention? Proper authority, right intention, last resort. If there's a presumption against the large-scale killing of human beings, then in order to demonstrate your moral bona fides, you've got to try to settle it short of war. That's where several of you said we ought to be able to find a way. And that's a reasonable argument. But it's a reasonable argument that may have limits. Again, to quote Michael Walter, Walter says, the problem with this principle, last resort, is there's always room for one more conference in Geneva before you go to war. <laughs> so if you press it too far, then you eliminate the possibility of just war. Proper authority, right intention, last resort, moral possibility of success. That doesn't sound like a moral principle, but think about it. What that principle says is, if you're going to go to war, there's got to be some coherence, connection, between your objectives and the means you're going to use to achieve them. So when you were in grammar school, Kosovo was going up in flames. And the Kosovars were getting killed badly by the Serbs. And so the West said, we'll intervene, but we're not going to use any ground troops, because ground troops mean casualties for us. So we're going to intervene with air power and air power alone, not unlike Syria. The difficulty was that the use of air power went on for weeks, and it didn't seem to be getting anywhere. And so people were literally saying, we're running out of targets. We've hit everything that could be hit, unless we're going to flatten their cities. But then the memory of Dresden draws a line against that. So moral possibility of success, what is it going to take to accomplish the objective? Don't fight a war that takes chaos and moves it to further chaos. And finally, proportionality. The final when question is proportionality. If your reason for, if your reason for going to war is to prevent an evil, don't fight a war that causes more evil than the good it produces. Let me give you an example of that. 1956. 1956, the Soviets are in control of Eastern and Central Europe. The Hungarians, a very tough people, decide they will rise up. And so the Hungarians essentially begin a revolution against the Soviets. The Soviet tanks roll into Budapest. The Soviets have tanks, the Hungarians have rocks. The West says, Hungary has a right to be free. But no one in the West said, and we ought to put NATO troops in Hungary. Because NATO troops in Hungary in 1956 are one step away from nuclear war. Don't fight a war that causes more harm than good. So 
Why can you go? Aggression, genocide, right to revolution. When can you go? Authority, right intent, last resort, moral possibility of success, proportionality. And then there is the question of how you fight the war. This is the 20th century question. In the 20th century, the emphasis has been on this question perhaps more than anything else. And this question, this argument says, the right to go to war is never unlimited. The way you fight can undercut your moral cause if you fight wrongly. And how you determine how to fight is based on two principles. The first is called non-combatant immunity. This is about civilians, if you will. And the argument is that the direct, intentional, purposeful killing of civilians is always wrong. This is the absolute rule embodied in the just war ethic, the absolute rule. So why should civilians be protected? Well, go back to why you can justify war. You can justify war only if you have identified a great wrong being done and you're trying to stop it. But if that principle's true, then only those doing the wrong are open to attack. Now people will say modern war cannot be constrained. There are no innocent civilians. To which I say, there are always the very young, the very old, and the Carmelite nuns. <laughs> Every society has some of those. And once you've identified them, you know what civilians are. And then you have to decide how many more <coughs> classes fit under civilians. Proportionality is simply, again, governing your tactics. The use of force must be limited not only in the war as a whole, but every tactic. So put yourself in the position of a commander of an air wing squadron. You're a colonel. It's World War II. Your briefing officer comes in and says, sir, madam, here's the situation. There's a tank factory outside Bonn, Germany. And that tank factory is turning out tanks left and right, killing our troops. We think that's a legitimate target. That sound right? Tank factory? Okay. And we want to hit it. So you say yes. He says, sir, madam, I need to tell you a little bit more about the tank factory. Around the tank factory is an orphanage, a hospital, a kindergarten, and the nuns. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now we're going to do our best to only hit the tank factory, <coughs> but we can't guarantee it. So I said the direct intentional killing of civilians is wrong. You aim at them. What about the non-intended killing of civilians? You might say, too much danger to too many people. Tank factory is a legitimate target, but we can't do the strike. We do that today. Decisions like that are made today. They were not made that way in World War II. OK, that's the framework. That's the framework. So, what kind of problems does that framework confront today? So, I've identified three really broad, complicated problems, and I have 20 minutes. <laughs> so, these are going to be a quick dust of complicated problems. Because I would argue we deal with three legacies today. We deal with the legacy of World War II, and that is the nuclear age which arose out of World War II. 
we deal with the legacy of the 1990s, which is the problem of humanitarian military intervention. And we deal with the, prob with the legacy of 9-11, which is the problem of terrorism. So an ethical theory needs to be tested by its internal coherence, its reasoning, its distinctions, but it also must be tested by its ability to help illuminate human problems. So what ethics is supposed to do is to break open complex human problems so they are not decided only, only on empirical data, but that ethics drives and shapes empirical data. War has its own logic. It does not have its own ethic. So the ethic is the logic imposed on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, excuse me, the ethic is the, is the, is the restraint imposed on the logic of war. So the nuclear age, the problem the nuclear age posed was essentially this. When you look at the just war argument, uh, it's the moral problem posed. When you look at the just war argument, you try to summarize it. The summary says some wars are morally acceptable, but the only morally acceptable war is a limited war. Limited in its purposes, why can you go? Limited in its methods, how do you fight? Limited in its intention, right intention. So, if limits are at the heart of morally justified war, what do you do with an age that produced the capability to threaten, literally, the universe in which we live? What kind of problem did that pose? A big one. Big one for this kind of war seems to be neither rational nor limited. Slowly, people came to that conclusion. At the beginning, right after World War II, there were people who said, all this is is one more step on, in a long history of starting with bow and arrows and then moving to, to guns and then moving to tanks and then moving to airplanes, one more step. One more step. There were other people that said, this changes the definition of war. So what do you do? Those who said this is one more step said, well, it's like all other use. We apply the standards to it. Those who applied the standards, many said, the standards don't fit. You can't limit this. But the weapons exist on both sides. So what do you do? What happens is that over a period of about 15 years, you developed a imperfect, for sure, <laughs> strategic synthesis. One side of the argument said, it's like all other use, no different. The other side of the argument said, you've got to get rid of these weapons. You can't have them at all. Neither of those won the argument. Use became what we call deterrence. Disarmament came, became what we call arms control. And so for the nuclear age, we tried to manage the nuclear age by deterrence and arms control. Now deterrence is the threat to use. It is the threat to use in response to use. And in the long treatment of this, we would be into dinner time before we get through. But if you go to your library and press deterrence in the computer, you will get enough to read to keep you busy, all right? But deterrence was a huge moral problem. Because even if it worked, even it, if it worked, it worked by threatening to kill without limits. 
if you strike me, I will strike back in a way to tell you how it was shaped. You say to the Soviet Union, you strike me and I will strike back in a way that will destroy 75% of your industrial capacity and 50% of your population. That's the threat. So the moral question of deterrence became, in my view, this. Is it morally acceptable to threaten to do the undoable if the threat to do the undoable is what keeps the undoable from being done? <laughs> and that's why it's always easier to criticize deterrence than to defend it. That's the best you get. Second problem, the Cold War ends 50 years of deterrence on arms control. And what happens is a massive change in the ethics of the use of force. The Cold War was a high-tech struggle, high-tech, profoundly rational, in quotes, <laughs> threatened to do the undoable, to prevent the undoable from being done. We used to call it the rationality of irrationality. That was what the Terence theory was called. But it was high tech. It depended on the rationality of your opponent. They had to understand the threat or else they might call your bluff. The Cold War collapses in the 1990s becomes not the rationality of irrationality becomes not the question of how you prevent ultimate catastrophe. The 1990s become what do you do about creeping chaos? The nouns change. The nouns of deterrence are Washington, Moscow, London, Paris, Beijing, Tokyo. Those were the places at the heart of the nuclear debate. The 1990s, the nouns of war are Somalia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Kosovo, the Balkans. New names dominate the political discussion. And the issue is not high tech. In the Balkans, they were using Gun, rifles from World War I when it started. In Rwanda, 800,000 people were killed and one of the principal weapons was a machete. But there was a different kind of moral problem. The moral problem here was the very order of international politics. The order of international politics, the rules by which nations are governed, were set in the 17th century. It was called the Westphalian Order. Coming out of the Treaty of Westphalia, which brought to an end the religious wars in Europe, and the religious wars in Europe were marked by interventions into other countries, because you didn't like their religion, or you didn't like their politics, etc. So Westphalia said, the way to solve this problem is two terms, sovereignty and non-intervention. Sovereignty means that you qualify as a state and you have defined boundaries. And those defined boundaries should not be violated by other states unless you violate their boundary. So sovereignty meant protection of the sovereign state to carry out its way of life as it chose, religiously, politically, economically. Non-intervention was the other side of the coin. States did not have a right to intervene inside another country because of what was going on inside that country unless a state violated another state, aggression. So, when the Balkans blow up, when Somalia collapses, when Rwanda goes 
toward genocide. It was one thing to say it's awful, terrible what's happened. It's another thing to say someone has the right to intervene inside that, quote, sovereign state and use force. International law said you don't have the right, or at least a lot of international lawyers said it. So even in Kosovo, which was moderately successful, some international lawyers said it's morally legitimate, but it's illegal. So do states, should states start to violate international law because of moral reasons? So the 90s, as you went through the cases, case by case, from the Balkans and Somalia to Kosovo, and then today to Syria. Do you override sovereignty? Do you simply obey sovereignty, let what happens, happens? Who has the right to do anything about it? Eventually, in the 1990s, people developed an argument that said, if there can be a just war, there also can be a just intervention. Tricky move, because just war was organized to deal with states dealing with states. And eventually, there arose out of the argument about just intervention something we call the principle of the responsibility to protect. The responsibility to protect changed the argument. <laughs> Rather than saying sovereignty meant you protect the state, it said sovereignty means the state has the responsibility to treat its citizens well, and if it cannot do that or will not do that, we have to look at devolving responsibility to others. It is still a very debated topic, a very, very debated topic but it has, sh it has shifted the intervention debate. Now, before we could get crystallization of that and agreement on that, we were still debating it as the 21st century began. We became, quote, distracted. And distractions called 9-11. Now, Terrorism is not new in politics. But generally speaking, the history of terrorism has been about domestic politics. It's a group within a state that wants more freedom, more self-determination, less government, or it wants to take over the government, and it uses terrorism. 9-11 was different. 9-11 had three characteristics. One, it was transnational terror. Secondly, it was transcendent terror. And thirdly, it was traditional terror. Transnational terror, what I mean by that is a non-state actor, a non-state actor demonstrated the capability to do massive damage to the strongest military power in the world a military that was larger than the next six states and a non-state actor hit it right at the most symbolic parts of its existence. So now the question becomes, what about non-state actors? Are they legitimate authorities or not? What do you do, etc.? Secondly, it was transcendent terror. Now, transcendent, what I mean by trans transcendence is a term that theologians use, tends to refer to God in some form or other. There were arguments made on religious grounds to justify the attack. That did not mean that the religion in question agreed with those arguments. There were arguments made in the Middle Ages to justify the Crusades. That did not mean the Crusades were justifiable. But 
the idea that when you mix religion and war, it gets very combustible is one of those lessons of history that we worry about. Thirdly, it was traditional terror, meaning by that, that it terrorists, by definition, aim at soft targets because they can't fight set pieces, set battles. They don't have those kind of resources. So civilians become the chosen target. So you have a transnational threat, transcendence involved, and traditional target and, and, and violation of traditional norms. So what we've got today is a world in which there can be three kinds of war. Interstate war is what the Cold War was about and still can happen. Israel, Iran, India, Pakistan, the US, Russia. Interstate war is not out of existence. Secondly, internal war, Somalia, Rwanda, Kosovo, generates the call for intervention, second kind of war. Thirdly, terrorism is war among state and non-state actors. So this moral tradition that has been around for 2,500 years, once again, has to consider a multiplicity of different forms of war. And it has adapted in the past, and the question is, can it adapt today? But it is now two minutes of 12, and I can't solve that problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can just get you up to the cusp of the problem, and you're going to live longer than I am, so you can work on this. <laughs> you can work on this. So I'd love to take questions, but I don't think that's in the agenda, because I think we're supposed to go to lunch, right? You can take one or two. <laughs> But that's hard to discriminate. That's like separating civilians and combatants. But, I, <laughs> but if someone has a burning question, I'll take it. Yes? Where do you categorize yourself? Where do I categorize myself? Okay. Uh, I hold this moral tradition. I think it is the best moral answer, tragic though it is, in a world in which we are not yet in nirvana. Uh, what do you do? So you have to be ready to deal with the possibility of conflict and keep conflict limited. So I think that's appropriate. Uh, I, was, I basically supported deterrence as the least morally objectionable way to manage the nuclear age. I now work with a different groups, um, uh, one major group that has a lot of senior statesmen in it who think it is time to think about going to zero nuclear weapons. But that's not going to be easy, but I think it's worthwhile thinking about. I strongly supported the idea that just intervention is possible and necessary. And my argument about terrorism is you need to remember the basic moral principle, which I didn't tell you. The basic moral principle in thinking about resisting terrorism is don't become a terrorist. So Abu Ghraib is not justifiable, even if opposing terrorism is. Torture is not justifiable, even if opposing terrorism is. So I think you can adapt this ethic to the three different kinds of war, interstate intervention, and terrorism that we have. Knowing that, whenever you're dealing with the ethics of war, you're dealing with what the Germans call a Grenz morale, a limit case morality. You're out at the outer edge of the moral universe, justifying war, the outer edge, just barely. Does that make sense? OK, all right. Thank <laughs> you.